Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Parvis Sadig. I'm a consultant, as Paul said, at uh, um, the Royal London Hospital, which is a major trauma centre in East London. Um, and my subspecialty area of interest is extremity uh, reconstruction post-trauma. Um, and as such, I see many patients with unsalva unsalvageable limbs who go on to amputation. Uh, many of these rehabilitate extremely well with modern prosthetics, but some don't. Um, and of these, many would benefit from osseointegration. And this is what led to my interest in OI. I'd like to thank my colleagues, especially Jason Souza at the Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center in the US uh, for sharing some of their clinical images with me. So what problems do amputees uh, face with standard socket prosthetics? Well, focusing on transfemoral amputees, the majority of late and persistent complications relate to pressure on the skin by the socket. These include pressure sores, blistering, hyperhidrosis, um, and the development of cutaneous fungal and bacterial infections. Most transfemoral amputees suffer with these problems to some extent. A second difficulty for transfemoral amputees involves placement of a prosthetic foot on the ground, as the proprioceptive sense for this um, action comes from pressure and friction between the skin and the socket, varying amounts of friction will produce varying degrees of proprioceptive feedback. So the tighter of the socket will allow for better proprioceptive feedback and residual limb control. Um, however, a, uh, this will create more problems at the skin prosthesis interface. A looser socket may be more comfortable but will lead to uh, less uh, stability during ambulation. Uh, this is a patient of mine whose legs were machine gunned in his early teens in a demonstration in the ex-Yugoslavia back in the 1980s. Both were amputated below the knee, but as the tibias continued to grow, they created a very tight adherence between the bony residuum and the overlying soft tissues. Due to unstable scarring, limiting his prosthetic use on the right, I agreed to shorten and revise the stump on this side. Although a good result seems to have been achieved, he reports that his left stump is by far the best and that the tight adherence of the soft tissues on this side with minimal motion and shear at the skin prosthesis interface allows him unrestricted pain-free ambulation. So this case challenged my previously held uh, belief that stumps should be well padded. Of course, in keeping with the central tenet of plastic reconstructive surgery, we should strive to replace like for like. Here one can see that we have pedicled the glabrous tissue of the sole of the foot to resurface a traumatic BKA stump. This provides the most natural and best covering for the residuum. However, for most amputees, this is not an option. And indeed, for transfemoral am am amputees, the best like for like reconstruction that can be achieved is via osseointegration. This allows a patient to dispense with a socket, thus eliminating pressure difficulties, hyperhidrosis, and skin-related um, problems. The technique also immediately restores the critical sense of osseoproprioception, so amputees can feel their limbs in space. As Professor Brannan Mark uh, stated, this technique originated from the field of dentistry in 1965, and has been well established for the treatment of the edentulous jaw for many years, demonstrating a five and 10 year survival of dental implants in mandibular bone of 98 and 95% respectively. The main reason we see such good survival rates with dental implants is due to the periodontal membrane, which is the fleshy tissue between tooth and tooth socket that holds the tooth in place, attaches it to the adjacent teeth and enables it to resist the stresses of chewing. However, this does not translate into the arena of skin epithelium and is the root cause of the problems we see related to the soft tissue implant interface with regards to osseointegrated limbs. So what techniques are currently available to us? We have the OPRA two-stage technique with thin soft tissue flaps as pi pioneered by Professor Banamar, the compress system, with thick soft tissue flaps, which is being used within the confines of clinical trials in the US. The Australian one-stage technique being pioneered by Al Madiris and the emerging technique of using an Integra interface. I will now give a brief overview of each of these techniques 
whilst focusing on the soft tissue implant interface. The percutaneous component of the Oprah system is the abutment, which has a smooth, polished surface to minimize contact and friction at the skin interface. The Oprah system is generally, generally employed in a two-stage manner, although in suitable compliant patients with adequate bone stock, a one-stage technique can be used. This slide demonstrates the second stage process whereby the thin soft tissue flap is created to cover the distal end of the femur. The skin flap is completely defatted, as demonstrated in this image, before being transposed and quilted down to the distal end of the femur. This technique produces a soft tissue implant interface where there is minimal redundancy and movement. A drawback with this approach, however, is the compromised blood supply to the skin flap, distal to where the implant is exteriorized. In this image uh, from the Walter Reed Institute, uh, skin necrosis has been encountered, which required debridement in theater, application of negative pressure wound therapy, and subsequent flap re-advancement to achieve an acceptable result. So with increased adherence of the soft tissues around the interface junction and the benefits that this affords, one has to accept the relative disadvantage of reduced vascularity to the skin flaps and the risks that come with this. The compress system was first developed as an endoprosthetic system for oncologic limb salvage reconstruction by the Biomet Corporation the intramedullary part of the implant is attached to the bone by transverse pins in a bone anchor plug. A porous coated collar designed to promote osseointegration is located at the distal interface um, of the amputated bone. To enhance osseointegration and to prevent stress shielding of the bone, the concept of compliant pre-stress stress is utilized, exposing the bone collar interface to a compressive force. The porous titanium collar that sits over the distal end of the bone promotes soft, uh, soft tissue ingrowth and bony hypertrophy, thereby sealing off the intramedullary uh, component of the system. This design therefore does not allow for a thin dermal flap to directly abut the distal bone end. Due to its relatively short intramedullary length, this system has the potential to be applied to short femoral stumps. The percutaneous interface is characterized by a smooth, low friction surface similar to the other OI systems. And as no direct dermal to distal bone adherence can be achieved due to the porous metal collar, thicker soft tissue flaps are therefore created around the soft tissue implant interface. And as such, a relative degree of movement at this interface level has to be accepted. This can lead to hypergranulation and the production of serous fluid, leading to low-grade infection. That can precipitate a return to the OR for debridement, and in this instance, the use of negative pressure wound therapy has been deployed. But unfortunately, the movement at the soft tissue implant interface has persisted, resulting in hypergranulation and <coughs> persistent serous discharge at the skin interface junction, requiring antibiotics. So with the compressed system, the vascularity of the peri-implant soft tissue flaps is increased. However, this is at the, at the expense of adherence, with the resulting disadvantages that come with this. This system is currently being used within the confines of clinical trials in the US, and to date, other than a preliminary report detailing a series of 13 patients, not much in the way of long-term data is available to us. So the Almadiris one-stage technique, or Osseointegration Group of Australia Accelerated Protocol 2, uses the Osseointegrated Prosthetic Limb, or OPL, which is a press fit design. In the OPL system, the percutaneous interface consists of a dual cone adapter, and the percutaneous surface of the implant is smooth polished and has a titanium niobium dioxide coating aimed to minimize soft tissue adhesion and friction at the percutaneous interface. A distal flare of the intramedullary component exists, but unlike the compressed system, there is no porous cap located over the distal bony residuum. The soft tissue approach adopted by the Australian group include, includes guillotine amputation of the stump 
without shortening of a bony residuum and reorganization of a residual muscle groups around the bone using absorbable purse string sutures. Further refashioning of the stump is then um, performed to achieve a soft tissue envelope with minimal redundancy. The area of the soft tissue opposing the distal end of the bony residuum is identified and defatted in a similar technique to Professor Branamark's, and the dermis is then sutured around the periosteum of the distal femur before a circular skin cora is used to create a percutaneous opening. This study is the first study to describe as well as report on the safety and efficacy of a single stage procedure for the osteointegrated reconstruction of amputated limbs um, and has a relatively large sample size of 105 patients. However, two-year follow-up data is yet to be published. The Integra interface, which is a relatively contemporary concept, um, this is a case from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham where the OPL device has been used and Integra has been deployed to resurface the soft tissues immediately adjacent to the osteointegrated implant. And this has then been resurfaced with a split thickness skin graft at a second stage in the standard fashion. As is apparent from this image, there is very little soft tissue redundancy adjacent to the implant and therefore little motion at this interface level can be expected. Indeed, this technique of using Integra to resurface problematic stumps prior to osseointegration is gaining popularity. And this is a case from the Walter Reed Military Institution of the US where an area of unstable scarring has been excised and resurfaced with Integra in preparation for OI. The OPRA system was then deployed once the Integra had become neovascularized before resurfacing with an SSG. Once the graft has matured, soft tissue flaps can then be raised at stage two using the same technique as described earlier in the talk, aiming to achieve a thin soft tissue flap overlying the distal bony residuum. And interestingly, in this case, no skin flap necrosis was encountered, despite the fact that the flaps consisted of, the, of Integra and SSG as opposed to native dermis. So which technique produces the fewest complications at the implant soft tissue interface well, in short, the jury's out. In a recent systematic review from the Netherlands published in August 2018, it was concluded that there was no clear consensus in the studies included on which complications were reported. And in addition, in addition there was a huge variation with regards to follow-up intervals themselves. Moving forwards, it would be useful to formulate a core set of complications that can be reported at fixed time points by all groups, preferably using a recognized classification system. So in conclusion, the ultimate goal is to produce a soft tissue seal akin to the periodontal ligament. However, this is currently not clinically achievable. We must therefore strive to achieve a chronic wound which is manageable and reduces the risk of implant threatening infection. It appears that this is best achieved by reducing the soft tissue redundancy of the stump whilst maintaining good vascularity to the soft tissue flaps and minimizing movement at the interface between soft tissues and, and the implant. Collaborative long-term outcome studies are awaited to help us provide an evidence-based approach to best serve our patients. Thank you.